Welcome to this live cast on our future economies. Capitalism, despite the tremendous increase in worldwide welfare through its innovative power and freedom, has at the same time a number of negative consequences. A transition is necessary to overcome ecological destruction, decrease in quality of life and growing inequality. Given geopolitical developments, Europe has an important role to play in this transition. In the live casts, we will start an open dialogue and discuss this transition with internationally renowned economists from all over the world. Questions will pass by, such as Each week, we will discuss these matters with two economists, resulting in 10 online dialogues in 10 weeks, where we will share viewpoints and collect ideas on how capitalism's innovative and creative powers can go hand in hand with fostering an equal and just society. A different subject every week. Together, we can build a basis for economies that are beneficial to all of us. You can participate by putting your questions and remarks in the chat. So, let's talk. Welcome everybody to this fifth edition of the series The Future of Capitalism, a series initiated by more and designed by Moral Markets uh, in collaboration with Pakhuis de Zwijger. And uh, today, uh, the title of today is Free Markets and Huge Inequality, an inescapable marriage. Uh, and probably the speakers will comment on this title of this evening. Because inequality between countries has become smaller over time, but in some countries, inequality is actually on the rise. Many fear that societal uprisings and further polarization can be the result if this inequality gets bigger. How does increasing inequality affect these societies and what role do free markets and technological innovation play uh, in, these, in creating these phenomena? Today, we will speak to three speakers um, in the series in which we research the future of capitalism. We will start uh, by uh, Jim, with Jim Suri, who will um, read read out a column he wrote on behalf of a think tank of young economists. After that, we will have an in-depth interview with two speakers and after that, an open dialogue. The first speaker is Elizabeth Anderson and she's a professor in ethics, social and political philosophy, feminist theory, social epistemology and the philosophy of economics and the social sciences. Scientists, sciences. She's the author of Value in Ethics and Economics, The Imperative of Integration, and most recently, Private Governments, How Employers Rule Our Lives, and Why We Don't Talk About It. Today, we will talk about it. Uh, Professor Anderson is currently working on a history of egalitarianism, and she's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and designed and was the first director of the program in philosophy, politics, and economics at UM. The second person we're going to interview in depth is François Bourguignon. He is the former chief economist of the World Bank and has been the director of the Paris School of Economics. From 85 to, to his retirement in 2013, he's a, he was a professor of economics at the École des Altitudes et Sciences Sociales in Paris. Paris. And in 2016, Mr. Bourguignon was awarded the Dan David Prize. His research deals mainly with income redistribution in developing and developed countries. And he also sat on the scientific committee of the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research, the Council of Economic Advisors of the French Prime Minister and the Executive Committee of the European Development Network. Welcome to you all. Um, this is not a television show, it's a live cast. And the unique difference is that if you want to participate in the conversation uh, while watching, you can. And we invite you to do so. 
Um, it gives you the opportunity to, sh to ask your question to these very interesting speakers of tonight. For in, in order to be able to do so, you have to go to the Zoom webinar, which you can find on the program page of tonight's event on, Pakhuis de Zwijgers, on the Pakhuis de Zwijgers site. And if you then enter the webinar, you can ask questions in the Q&A button, uh, with the Q&A button, and we will receive uh, the curated ones. Um, there is a program maker uh, uh, reading all these questions. The curated one, we will receive them here, and I can ask them to our speakers. Uh, please do so, and feel free to, to start the discussion with, with them. Okay. Um, hopefully, uh, lots of you are doing it. We have some uh, viewers who have, uh, we know, have viewed all uh, four editions already. And it's also nice if you relate uh, questions to the events uh, uh, we already organized. It was interesting. It's interesting to see what kind of things are on your mind then. Let's start this meeting. And as I already said, we'll do that with the column of Jim Suri. Today, we talk about the relationship between free markets and equality. In my view, in the end, it's about freedom of the people. Linked to this view, Scottish free thinker Francis Wright famously quoted, equality is the soul of liberty. There is in fact no liberty without it. In first instance, you might think that free markets will lead to free people. Anderson also argues that the origin of the free market economy emerges from the need to get rid of unfree labor and slavery and to get self-sufficient. Milton Friedman further states that free markets would offer decentralized decision-making power. And yes, free markets brought us a tremendous range of benefits. However, in our current market economy, freedom of one harms the freedom of another. A dominant free market economy combined with the high inequality, actually leads to decentralization of decision-making power, which leads to even more inequality. Of course, this causality is restricted by social norms, but people are still subject to power structures, which are enlarged by the dynamics of free markets. Anderson defines this as a negative form of freedom, where states have nothing to say about corporates. Within this form of freedom, we see the accumulation of power. We now find ourselves in a situation where most of the people work to make month's end, while others passively, directly or indirectly, via the financialization of the economy, benefit from this labor force. To repeat some numbers, almost half of the global wealth is now owned by 1% of the population. The value of the combined assets of the richest 10 people is higher than the yearly GDP of most countries. And in 2018, it took only 26 billionaires to equal the total wealth of the poorest 50% of mankind. In order to change this trend, today's guests already gave some guidance. For example, democratizing corporations by empowering workers, correct free market failures via regulation, and a more equal distribution of opportunities like access to credit, healthcare, and education. Furthermore, if we want to have peace and a more free and equal society with a growing population and a staggering decline of the quality of our natural world, we must redefine the way we consume. Since a rise in welfare via materialistic consumption stresses our natural world, we may shift towards the dematerialization of our economy. Here, we could focus more on immaterial consumption while simultaneously making our material economy more sustainable, circular, and with a focus on quality instead of quantity. Pope Franciscus states in Laudato Si that the root problem of the ecological crisis lays in our technocratic approach to the world, in which we see no intrinsic value in lesser beings and no special value in human beings. Within this mindset, we think that we can solve ecological problems by technological innovation and efficiency, but this may not be the case. The interaction between welfare and ecology can thus be extended with technology. Bourguignon 
speaks about jobless recovery, where the economy grows without a similar increase in jobs. We see an increase in the demand of high-skilled workers, but a decrease in demand for low- and middle-skilled workers. This leads to even more inequality. Ideally, in my point of view, technology leads to more free time, recovery of our natural world, and a higher standard of well-being for all of us. Because after all, why do we need so to work so hard? Crucial in this view is the question who owns this technology and who will receive the benefits of production. To conclude, I believe that in order to improve life on Earth for everyone and everything, we have to organize a model which centralizes the well-being of all living things instead of holding on to a model which maximizes the wealth of the few at the cost of the many, while destroying the living sphere of our planet. Thank you very much. My name is Jim Richard Suri. <clears throat>
So they're, they don't have any rights of participation in that government, even though they're ruled by it. Uh, uh, and, and that's really the source of domination within the workplace uh, uh, in a formation that I call private government. So in your book, for example, you use Ronald Coase's theory of the firm, for example, and you research, you illustrate that firms are kind of small command centers, command economies where contracts intentionally, for example, leave uh, vague the exact duties of, of work. Um, and you seem to imply that this vagueness is not accidental because it almost always seems to benefit the employer. Um, how does this vagueness, for example, in these contracts benefit the employer or the upper party. I just want to stress that any well-run organization is going to have to leave a lot of room for discretion in order to get its business done. So uh, you can't have a completely minutely specified contract that's really efficient for productive purposes because there's always unanticipated circumstances you're going to have to rally workers around to solve problems that weren't already anticipated and written into the contract. The difficulty is that at least in the American uh, context, uh, the terms of the employment contract are so open-ended that they give power to employers to regulate uh, workers' lives in ways that really have no efficiency rationale whatsoever. Or if it has an efficiency rationale, employers have the right to regulate workers' lives that severely impair other essential freedoms, the right to privacy and so forth. Uh, uh, that it's important to protect uh, both on duty and off duty. But in the U.S. context, a worker could be fired for, for instance, uh, taking a political position off duty uh, or endorsing a candidate that the boss doesn't like. There are no protections against that. So you could be fired for your off duty behavior or off duty recreation behavior, uh, choice of marriage and sexual partners all kinds of things that, uh, that workers take for granted that they ought to be able to do without the scrutiny or sanction of their employer could lead to job loss in, in the American context. So we have an open end kind of power that bosses have over their workers in innumerable cases in which they've exercised that power, even though there's not even a remote hint of economic rationale for it. Mm. Isn't this um, an extreme example, or is this more common than we tend to think it is? In fact, it's extremely common. So a very large percentage of American workers are subject to suspicionless drug testing. Uh, They have every word monitored, every keystroke monitored, even when they're on breaks. Uh, they can have their phone conversations with their family monitored if it takes place within the office. We see a regime of comprehensive surveillance and minute control of innumerable workers uh, at work. And this is not, these are not isolated. We're talking about large percentages of American workers are subject uh, uh, to this kind of regulation. So many workers actually lead lives of quiet desperation, coerced by their lack of bargaining power and some harsh or perhaps sadistic bosses? Oh, absolutely. For instance, let's just take the example of sexual harassment. Uh, almost all... <laughs> Workers who suffer sexual harassment keep their silence. Why? Because there's no possibility of getting any justice within the system. If they, in fact, the vast majority of harassment lawsuits that are filed in the United States are actually for retaliation rather than for the original harassment uh, uh, because they get fired if they complain. Well, <laughs> it's known to workers that they'll get fired if they complain about conditions. So no wonder conditions are awful. And it's not just sexual harassment. There's all kinds of goes on at the workplace. And there's no regulations against that as long as the boss isn't discriminating in, 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 in the bullying behavior. It can go on and there's no workers have no recourse under the law at all for that. Yeah. So what can we do to make, uh, make sure that market relations become more voluntary or more equal, so to speak? 
Well, I do think that here's a place where the United States could learn something from uh, some European practices. I think that we have to reform the constitution of the government of the workplace and, and elements of democracy. Uh, and it's high time, for instance, the United States started experimenting seriously with models of co-determination, which were pioneered in Germany. Uh, and we also need to strengthen labor unions, which are the fundamental basis which workers can complain about work conditions uh, uh, and still have protection from getting fired for the mere act of complaining. So are any of these ideas, because as you mentioned, they are um, very embedded within the American context, are some of the ideas you mentioned applicable to the European context as well? Or uh, is it just possible that you could learn from the European context and there's nothing <laughs> well, wrong with that? <laughs> one of the phenomena that we see uh, across many capitalist countries is the rise of uh, precarity. So our temporary workers, zero hours contract workers, and, and these people are incredibly vulnerable <laughs> So even the minutest kind of unsatisfactory behavior from the manager's point of view could lead to job loss or not enough hours to support oneself. Uh, uh, and, and, and so that also, I think, makes many workers in Europe as well as the United States uh, vulnerable to arbitrary uh, and abusive treatment by their employers because they have such a continuous connection uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the party who's uh, directing their labor. Yeah. So we started off this interview um, by asking the question, is it an inescapable marriage, free markets and inequality? And um, I'd like to ask you as a closing question, Ms. Professor Anderson, um, is this idea of um, this coercion in work, how should we regulate that? How should we, how should we, build, uh, for example, regulation around that? Should it be coming from within firms themselves or from governments, politicians, and who are going to, who's going to do that? I think we have to design the constitution of the government of the firm to empower workers to have a voice in management. And that's critical. So what I would say is there is, it isn't inevitable. There's not an inevitable marriage between markets and inequality, but you have to get the regulations right. And you have to have regulations that empower the parties who in the current system are relatively weaker. And you have to have regulations that break up concentrations of power, such as we see, for instance, in technology where we have companies that completely dominate high tech, right? There has to be antitrust. Thank you, Professor Anderson. Thank you for your answers. We'll come back to that. Looking forward to the discussion later on in this evening. Let's move on to the next part of the show. Yes, and that's the in-depth interview uh, with Professor Francois Bourguignon, again by uh, David van Overbeek. Thank you, Natasha. Professor Bourguignon, thank you very much for being here tonight as well. Um, tonight's title, Free Markets and Inequality, an Inescapable Marriage. Do you agree with that? Um, roughly, yes. <laughs> but uh, I believe that uh, you need to introduce uh, many nuances in, uh, in this uh, statement. Um, we had the markets for uh, many, many years. Uh, let's say, let's see, if we go back to Second World War, uh, we had markets uh, ever since then, but uh, for uh, 30 years, inequality didn't change. Um, and it is true that uh, uh, we started to see some increase in inequality, on, in income inequality. I'll come back to what inequality is about. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time of the uh, so called uh, so-called the liberal revolution, which was undertaken by uh, in particular uh, Margaret Thatcher and uh, Ronald Reagan in uh, the US. 
And it is true that uh, we observed that inequalities started to increase in the US and in the UK uh, exactly at that time. Continental Europe, it was a different uh, story. Uh, so this means that uh, certainly the deregulation that took place in those days, which uh, uh, to some extent uh, made markets uh, freer, uh, played a role in uh, the increase in inequality. But there are other factors which played a, a big role. Globalization was certainly a huge uh, uh, factor in uh, increasing inequality, uh, basically by providing or by uh, modifying the allocation of uh, total income between capital and labor. Capital benefited much more than labor from globalization, and labor, to some extent, was hurt by globalization. Uh, and another factor which is quite important is technology. So to say that uh, deregulation is more important than globalization or is more important than uh, uh, technology is difficult to say. Moreover, we can see that uh, the three factors play together and that uh, the structure of markets is affecting the change in technology and the structure of the market is affecting and is affected by globalization. Yes. So roughly, yes, I agree with the fact that uh, freer markets uh, is generating in general more inequality, but the channels uh, are maybe uh, a bit different. Yeah. So it's deregulation, globalization, technology, all of these forces, you need to, com you need to combine them together to explain for this uh, rise in inequality in some countries you mentioned. Just to get yeah, I, would like to, I would like to add something on inequality. I think it is quite important to make a distinction mm -hmm. between uh, what we call market income inequality. That is, this is inequality in the incomes that are generated by the market. Labor wages, dividends, uh, capital gains, etc. And uh, what we can call disposable income inequality, which is the same inequality after taxes and transfers uh, and all kinds of benefits which are being given to uh, people at the bottom of the market income distribution. Yeah. And what happens is that we observe that in many countries, in most advanced countries, there was an increase in market income inequality at least until the beginning or maybe the mid 2000s, maybe until the crisis of 2008. Then it stopped, except in the US. Uh, and at the same time, observe that disposable income inequality didn't behave in the same way. And uh, uh, the uh, disposable income inequality has been much flatter over time than market income inequality. This is quite important because it shows that the redistribution system is able to correct the inequalities that are directly generated by the market. Yes, thank you. A very good distinction. Um, so one of the other things that caught my attention when reading your book is that you say factual measures of data and statistics don't always rhyme with prevailing um, popular opinion. As you mentioned in your book in 2015, most Americans did not believe that inequality had risen over the last years in their country, um, despite evidence pointing in the other direction. Has this changed over time? Uh, do people in America and Europe agree now more that there has been a rise in inequality, as you just mentioned? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, Elizabeth Anderson might be uh, have a better uh, position to answer that question. But I don't think that uh, this has changed quite a lot in, uh, in, in the US. The point is, of, the, the main point in the US is that the way the public opinion is looking at inequality is not by looking at income, current income inequality. It is more by looking at opportunities. And uh, for a long time, some sociologists say that things are changing, but for a long time, uh, the American public opinion saw that uh, this was a land of uh, uh, completely open opportunities, yes. free opportunities. And uh, uh, academics know that this is not the case, but there is still this kind of uh, illusion in the mind of uh, many uh, mm -hmm. American people. So it was, Quite interesting to see that uh, 
uh, this increase in inequality, that uh, big increase in inequality, that uh, income inequality that was observed in the US, didn't trigger big reactions, uh, basically because people kept living on the illusion that uh, uh, there was some inequality, some equality of uh, opportunity. Yeah. In Europe, things are uh, slightly different. I would say that Europeans are putting much more uh, uh, emphasis on uh, uh, inequ income inequality, and to some extent, too much emphasis. And I can tell you, uh, public opinion, uh, public polls, not a long opinion polls, not a long time ago, uh, um, showed that uh, in the Netherlands and in France, uh, many people, more than half of uh, the population, thought that inequality had increased over the last 10 or 15 years, whereas this was not true. Uh, at least looking, as I said before, to uh, disposable income. Yes. Uh, so this means that there is illusion, and uh, we are not clear about what kind of inequality uh, people are uh, referring to when they say that inequality has increased. And I would like to take as an example the point that uh, Elizabeth Anderson made about uh, the condition of workers and the fact that uh, there may be a lot of inequality among uh, different firms because the status or the condition of the freedom of workers is not the same. So this kind of inequality in uh, working conditions is something that we are not really capturing uh, statistically, but which may be something that the people have in mind when they refer to inequality. Yeah. This is a difficulty with this uh, 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 concept of inequality is that it is seen in different ways by people, by different people, and uh, statisticians and economists are able only to measure one uh, particular set of inequality concepts. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Bourguignon. Um, I think that is it's very interesting. You mentioned this uh, this myth or this illusion that people hold with regard to their own situation, uh, you know, whether in Europe or in America, when you compare it to the facts. And in this series, we're trying to reimagine capitalism, which is also means taking a critical perspective with regard to our own presuppositions, you could say. Uh, in your book, you mentioned another one. You, you actually take arms against this idea of a general trade-off between an efficient economy and a just one. Um, I want to ask you, is an unequal society or economy also an unjust society? And why do you think, uh, or economy, and why do you think that's the case? Uh, okay, I mean, I would say that uh, an unequal, I mean, an, if there is excessive inequality in a country, I would certainly not call that country just or fair. Now, the issue, because we need a minimum inequality in order to generate incentives for people to uh, develop uh, uh, to innovate or to work or uh, to make efforts or to uh, take risk in order to uh, uh, build uh, new uh, firms, etc. So we need some minimum inequality, but too much inequality, and this is, I believe, the main point, is certainly unfair. But more than that, and I believe um, this is uh, the important point in, uh, in, in the book, more than that, we know that excessive inequality is inefficient in the sense that uh, this is making the economy work much uh, less well than it could work with a more egalitarian uh, distribution. Yeah. So uh, this is the way in which I'm saying that there is no trade-off really between uh, uh, inequality or equality and, uh, and efficiency. Uh, to some extent, uh, uh, too unequal a society will in general become an, an inefficient uh, uh, society. Yeah. And there are reasons to uh, think about them I mean, to believe that this is the case. Yes. Last question. You know, this goes through inequality of opportunity. Thank you. Last question, Professor Bourguignon. So how can greater equality accelerate GDP growth? And how can we make sure that the right people prosper from a growth in GDP? Um, OK, first, we want to make sure that uh, the produce of uh, GDP growth is uh, distributed in a fair way in uh, the population. If you look at the American economy, which is, um, OK, other economies are not doing that well. So, But uh, the point with the US is that it is a kind of a typical case 
uh, it is an iconic case. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at uh, growth in the United States over the last 30 years, then we show that uh, uh, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the total produce of growth has gone to the top 10 percent of the population. When you look at the median uh, household in uh, uh, the US, over the last 30 years, the increase in the uh, standard of living of this median household has been a few percentage points mm -hmm. in 30 years when the economy, when GDP per capita has been growing at uh, at least 1% every year over the last 30 years. So here you see that uh, certainly growth has been extremely inegalitarian in the, the United States. Now, what should you do for growth to be egalitarian? You should intervene trying to modify the structure of the economy. And uh, as uh, it was said before, you want probably to regulate uh, many parts of the economy. In particular, you want to make sure that uh, antitrust uh, uh, laws are working correctly. Uh, you want to eliminate too much market power in uh, several sectors, not only the high-tech sectors, but practically in all sectors of the economy. Uh, so this is intervening uh, upstream. Uh, in uh, the way the economy works, yeah. and can also intervene downstream, saying because the economy is not working well enough, we will be uh, correcting by taxes and uh, um, and uh, redistribution. A very important point that uh, is to be um, emphasized and uh, stressed is the fact that over time, in uh, most countries, the uh, tax system has become less and less and less progressive. Uh, and uh, uh, today we uh, see the top 1% of uh, uh, the population in many economies, the market income going, the, 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 the proportion going to that people uh, increasing enormously. It is possible to correct that with the appropriate tax rate. But in uh, societies where tax rate has been uh, uh, being uh, reduced uh, year after year, then of course this is not possible. And the only way uh, redistribution inequality has not uh, has been contained or has not been growing uh, faster in uh, the US is basically because very much has been done at the bottom in order to try to help all those people who are in precarious conditions, uh, all those people who are uh, 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 at the limit of uh, uh, getting a job or not getting a job. Uh, this is where the redistribution and the fight against inequality has taken place. Yeah. But we should not forget about the top. Yes. Thank you, Professor Bourguignon. Let's see if we can help those people at the bottom in the precarious positions uh, during this discussion. Let's move over to the next part of tonight. Yeah, and that part is actually um, the open debate uh, round where uh, the speakers are just uh, invited to, to respond to each other. And uh, we will also post some questions the audience actually has uh, for you. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to invite Professor Anderson uh, to respond, of course, to uh, Professor Bourguignon. What's your first line of thought when you he heard him speaking? I don't think actually that we disagree uh, about that. I think we have a lot of uh, agreement here. I, I do agree that some some measure of inequality is, is necessary for markets to function, but it doesn't have to be nearly as much as, uh, certainly not remotely as much as what we see in the United States today, or even starting in the 1970s. Mm. Uh, the, the evidence suggests that you can have much lower degrees of inequality and even have a more efficient and productive uh, uh, economy than what we see in the United States. I, I want to comment on e equality of opportunity and why that has been historically such a powerful notion in the United States. It comes from the fact that such a huge percentage of the American population is immigrants. Hmm. And the one place where the United States very consistently has dramatically improved people's uh, standard of living 
is by just letting people in. <laughs> it's a very consistent experience of immigrants that they, <clears throat> when they come to the United States, they experience much better opportunities than the country from which they came. And, and so their income leaps as a result of that. I immigration is, is the main contribution that the United States makes to uh, reducing global inequality. Now, of course, we have a, a president now who's trying to clamp down on that and has actually wreaked havoc on the immigration system. Uh, but, but even to this very day, uh, notwithstanding the last four years, it remains the case that immigrants overall tend to have a, a very successful experience in, in the United States. And that what, that's what leads Americans with so much immigration in their past. Uh, you know, my, my grandparents came from Europe to the United States. Yeah. And they all experienced this as America is a land of opportunity. And for immigrants, in many respects, even to this day, it still is. And so that creates the illusion that America is a land of opportunity because it's a kind of historical lag. People aren't catching up yeah. to the memories, basically, that their grandparents <laughs> and, and parents have. And of course, it's also uh, it's also uh, the American dream is also something you which aspires you or inspires you, but also aspires you to do better. So I can imagine it's a powerful myth. Um, but um, uh, let me let me ask you a question by the audience, uh, Johan Graafland, who asks um, about this discussion about uh, both of you mentioned that some inequality is uh, uh, necessary, um, and he asks you where do you hold the threshold. He asks. Is inequality a matter of justice if basic rights are respected in society? Uh, it's a nice philosophical question. I think uh, uh, Professor Anderson, and then perhaps uh, 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 we can we can also go to you, Mr. Bourguignon. Professor Bourguignon, Ms. Professor Anderson, please. Is it yes. if basic needs are met? Is it still a question of justice? Well, I think there are, is a real question of justice uh, concerning the structure of opportunities for acquiring income and wealth. Uh, my dissertation advisor was John Rawls, who wrote a theory of justice back in the 1970s. Mm. And he had a pretty reasonable response. Uh, he said inequalities need to be shown to redound to the advantage of everyone. And there are some inequalities that will do so. Um, in fact, you can find that criterion all the way back to the French Revolution. Okay. You can you can tolerate inequalities that that are to everyone's advantage. There will be some because you do need some degree of incentives uh, to get markets uh, working well. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be nearly the extent that we see in the United States today. Yeah, is 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 that the difference principle? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 can imagine it's great to write a thesis with John Rawls as a promoter. Um, uh, Yes, so that's the question. But then, and then let me let us reflect a bit on the mechanism you both uh, uh, um, are. We, we would like to investigate, and that is, you say um, uh, that some amount of inequality is necessary, but the amount of inequality we now see, for instance, in the U.S., is not productive and even not benefiting an efficient or uh, uh, functioning, well-functioning economy. Uh, can you elaborate on that a bit, uh, Mr. Bourguignon? Uh, yes, um, I would like to, to tell you about uh, an anecdote. I mean, when I was uh, in uh, the World Bank, uh, I visited very often China. But China was doing extremely well uh, in terms of growth, but they were doing extremely badly or well, I don't know what uh, word to use, in terms of inequality, because inequality was growing very, very fast. So I was telling them, look, you must be very careful because uh, if you let inequality uh, go uh, up uh, too much, uh, then at some stage uh, uh, it will be it will become a negative factor for economic growth. Yeah. Then uh, they understood uh, the argument, and then the question was: Could you tell us exactly at what level these coefficient of inequality should be uh, for us to take action <laughs> against inequality? And of course, this is exactly this question that uh, you're asking. Uh, how much is 
a reasonable level of inequality, and how much is excessive inequality? Uh, there is no uh, rigorous answer to that question because it depends on too many parameters. Yeah. But uh, yes, we have the feeling that uh, when, uh, after many years of stable, stable inequality, we see <coughs> the inequality is increasing enormously, it is very hard to believe that uh, uh, there is not something wrong uh, going on. And that if the issue was only to uh, maintain the incentives of people in order to generate uh, the uh, resources that is needed by the collectivity, then if uh, suddenly we see inequality going up that much, there must be something wrong. And I don't think that we can go much beyond this uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of argument. But I would like to um, come back on uh, uh, one point, which was the uh, equality of opportunities uh, uh, and uh, inequality of income. There is uh, in uh, the economic literature a very interesting curve, which we call the Gatsby curve, uh, referring to uh, the John Fitzgerald, uh, the Fitzgerald um, uh, novel mm -hmm. of uh, Gatsby. And uh, this curve shows that there is a very strong correlation between the inequality of opportunities as measured by the uh, intergenerational or the correlation between the earnings of fathers and earnings of parents and earnings of children. And uh, uh, there is a big correlation between this inequality of opportunities in the sense that the income or the earnings of uh, one generation depends on the parents and inequality, current inequality of income. So in egalitarian uh, countries, in terms of opportunities, are in egalitarian in terms of income. Mm -hmm. so this is interesting in the sense that it shows that there is a direct link between those two concepts. And probably the way to correct inequality uh, is to try to equalize opportunities as much as uh, possible. And this goes through education, this goes through uh, uh, tax, uh, taxation on uh, inheritance and this kind of thing. There are many ways we can, we can do that. Now the point is probably that we don't do that uh, enough. And uh, the last uh, remark I wanted to make about uh, what has been discussed uh, uh, earlier, and this reference to the uh, French uh, uh, motto, uh, liberté, uh, Egalité fraternity. and fraternity. Yes. I think it is quite important to keep in mind that the equality that uh, those people had back at the, in the time of the French Revolution was not the vertical inequality we are referring to today. It was much more a horizontal inequality, in the sense that people should be um, facing the same, uh, the same uh, a treatment in the society. There cannot be any kind of discrimination because between gender, there cannot be any discrimination between races, uh, between uh, different age groups. All people should have the same possibilities, should have the same rights. And uh, this is this equality that uh, the revolutionaries insisted upon. And I believe this is again another uh, dimension of inequality which is quite important today. And when we want to analyze, uh, uh, for example, the populist movements in many countries, I think it is important to keep in mind that this kind of uh, uh, horizontal inequality is important. For example, we observe in the US, in the UK, in uh, France, that the populist uh, uh, votes uh, in uh, those countries are very much related to a distinction between uh, small cities and big metropolises, uh, people who are, uh, uh, who are left in the small cities which are decaying and uh, uh, people who are living in a very dynamic context in big cities. This is a typical horizontal uh, inequality that may be more important than the vertical uh, income inequality and the fact that some people are earning much more than others.
Hmm. Connie, uh, Connie is asking a qu question related to that, one of the people in the audience. I don't have a last name, but uh, she asks you, uh, Professor Bourguignon, the question, do you agree that equal rights, she quotes, in an unequal society and large social inequalities? Uh, I'm not sure I understood the, the question. I mean, unequal rights or equal rights? Do you agree, she asks, that focusing on equal rights in an unequal society and larges social inequalities. Yeah, the, the issue with the, uh, I'm sure that uh, Professor Anderson has very much to say about yeah. it. Yeah, we'll go to her. <laughs> um, the point is that uh, uh, it is very difficult to oppose rights and uh, actual possibilities. Uh, and they have the right to do things. And they have the right to uh, to work, but uh, what do I do with the right to work if there is no work in the society where I'm yeah, living? Clear. And uh, there is a kind of tension between uh, rights and uh, uh, and realities and actual outcomes. Let's say rights and outcomes. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, we should uh, uh, simply stick by uh, equal rights and to say, because we have decided that uh, uh, rights were the same for everybody in the society, we are living in an equal society. This is not true. The point is that we have to put rights in front of uh, the rights that can be exerted and those which cannot be exerted. Professor Anderson. You, you can't do everything with rights, <laughs> okay? <laughs> rights are fundamental, they're a foundation of, of a free society, but you also just have to have sound policies and, and also a pretty robust uh, system of public investment. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the United States is an awful lot of shrinking of the state and, it, 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 and reduction of its capacity to uh, invest in public goods. We have a decaying infrastructure. Uh, we're not transitioning effectively to uh, a zero carbon economy. We, we need just massive <laughs> public investment that isn't happening and our schools are decaying and, and, and our healthcare system is monopolized and, and exploitative. So we, we just, <laughs> there's a whole panoply of policies that call rights mm. that nevertheless are absolutely in indispensable to creating a, a more just and equal society and frankly a more efficient one it's simply not efficient to have an economy in which workers get sick because their safety isn't protected at work and we have pollution everywhere uh, uh that's not efficient and then you waste it on waste money on the hospital system it might technically increase gdp but it's that's not a good way to increase human welfare Mm -hmm. Should we aim, um, uh, Professor Anderson, should we aim for GDP growth or should we aim for something else more perhaps in line with what Kate Rayworth's donut economy boils down to? Look, I do think that, that especially in America, we obsess over GDP growth at the expense of other measures of, of human well-being. Uh, so the United States, for instance, among whites in the United States, we see declining life expectancy. It's shocking. <laughs> what we're we're an unbelievably wealthy country, and, and 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 people are living less long. This is a serious crisis, <laughs> right? And we have we have a catastrophe with our public health agencies, with the United States having one of the worst records in the world dealing with the pandemic. Hey, we need a much more robust state capacity than we have. And unfortunately, we have an administration that's been uh, uh, gung-ho for destroying the, the capacity of the state to deliver any goods. We can't even run a competent census. We can't run even a post office. And we're talking about basic public services are decaying in the United States. Mm. Uh, but before we, we can talk an entire evening about def defunctioning institutions in the U.S. Um, uh, I mean, there is not only in the U.S. No, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the part I wanted to make and to answer the question is the yeah. fact that GDP is not an indicator of social welfare. No. It is an indicator of the level of economic activity and uh, we may uh, believe or we may expect 
that a higher GDP from a year to the next uh, will uh, uh, correspond to a better life for several people in the economy. But we cannot be sure that uh, everybody will be benefiting from it. And on the, over the long run, we certainly want to take into account other aspects of welfare, individual and social welfare. The uh, example of life expectancy is very good. On top of that, we know that uh, life expectancy is going down in the US, not because everybody has less life expectancy, but because a particular group of people are uh, uh, dying much earlier than it was the case before. And they are dying because they are in difficult and very precarious uh, situations. Yes. This is a very, very important uh, element that we want to take into account. And it is not clear that it is well, well, uh, uh, um, well uh, captured by uh, inequality figures. Mm. But this is typically the kind of thing that uh, we want to take into account. A few years ago, there was a commission, which was uh, uh, the initiative of the French president, and uh, the head of the commission were Joe Stiglitz, Amartya Sen, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, French economist, uh, fit to see. I was part of that uh, commission. And this commission produced uh, a, a report which is called Beyond GDP. Yes. And insisting on the fact that statistical institutes should go beyond measuring GDP. I mean, the point to say, uh, which is to say everything is fine because GDP is increasing, this is wrong. And uh, we have many, many... Uh, example of that, not only in the US, I mean, in all countries of the world. Yes. Thank you, Professor Bourguignon. I have a question for Professor Anderson. Uh, you just mentioned that you, we don't only need laws or policies, but we also need something else. And during this series, we're trying to reimagine capitalism, which is also trying to take note of some of the presuppositions that we hold, perhaps some of the myths in capitalism that we hold, but which are actually debunkable. Now, you could say that sometimes this inequality is justified, and this is also a question from our audience, um, because these rich billionaires, they also contribute to society because of the innovations that they hold and the jobs they create for people. Do you think that is a myth? And if so, how can we debunk it? Look, it's absolutely a myth. <laughs> <coughs> To whom do you attribute job creation? <laughs> it, jobs come from interaction of many elements, including consumer demand, right? So you can't just attribute it to the CEO of the corporation. We also have macroeconomic policy. Is the central banking system running, a, 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 running policies to create a tight job market or not? There are many factors that enter into this. And I am very much disinclined to credit the leading tech companies in the United States uh, uh, with as much productivity as their income. Look at the incredible destructive effects they've actually had. Facebook, for instance, has destroyed American newspapers at the local level. There's no more local news left, okay? And what that means is it's actually been measured the cost to municipalities, small cities who don't have a newspaper of borrowing money to pay for essential infrastructure, even like repairing the streets, the, the interest they have to pay rises when there is not a local newspaper. Why? Because lenders, creditors suspect that when there's no press who's supervising the activities, of uh, the, gov the local government, some kind of corruption is likely to go on and self-dealing and contracts that are overpaid in order to get votes from powerful business people in the locality. So everybody pays more money because Facebook has a, a, a relative monopoly on advertising revenue that's destroyed local papers, but it's worse than that. They're undermining democracy. The Facebook feeds are pumping propaganda and conspiracy theories, you know, to everybody's Facebook feed, <laughs> right? And the country's going. It, 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 there are other things besides looking at their profits to determine whether they're actually adding value uh, uh, 
to people's lives. Yeah. And I, you I could, have a lot of problems <laughs> with I can that imagine. assumption. Yeah. And you could even say that the commission of that, that was headed by Stieglitz for the French government, which proposed a broader definition of well-being instead of focusing on the GB GDP. Uh, and in our country, uh, the Netherlands, we also have now a new framework, right? It's called broader well-being well as a measurement beyond GDP. Uh, you could say, you could also look at companies like that, right? Not focusing only on the profits, but on the general attribution to other values for society. Um, uh, we started this conversation with a column of Jim Suri, right? Um, and um, in a few minutes, I'm going to invite him to join us to reflect on that. But one of the things he said was that for him, um, creating a just, more just world or a more equal world, it would also talk about a dematerialization of consumption. And we, we already talked a bit about natural environment the impact on climate change and the lack of climate policy. Uh, but Marije Schaafsma, who's also watching, is, is asking us to reflect a bit on that uh, as well. So uh, on, on the definition of consumption, dematerialization, and, and she asks, what is the relationship between inequality and the natural environment? C Professor Bukinjo, would you would you like to tell me what you are thinking when you hear a question like that? Um. Okay, I would say that uh, it would depend very much on uh, which country we are looking at. Um, if we look at uh, some developing countries, uh, poor people are uh, making a lot of uh, damage uh, uh, in the environment, for example, by uh, burning uh, forests or uh, thumbing trees. Um, and uh, at the same time, you can say that uh, those people in uh, the Amazon who are uh, burning the Amazon forest in order to uh, grow more uh, soya or whatever uh, are also uh, destroying the, uh, the environment. Now, you can see that uh, uh, there is some uh, behavior against the uh, environment on, on both ends of uh, the, the income scale. So it's difficult to say that uh, inequality per se is generating uh, more uh, environmental uh, uh, damage. And the main point about the environmental damage is uh, really a global <laughs> issue. So uh, we cannot say that, uh, and uh, the total uh, emission of uh, CO2, which is really the big issue uh, of uh, the environment uh, today and for the next uh, a uh, few centuries uh, is a, a global issue and depends, this time depends on GDP or depends also on the structure of GDP, but depends on uh, the size of uh, uh, GDP. And uh, uh, this is a very difficult issue. For example, let me take another example at the international level. Uh, the oh, are a big polluter in the world. Now they say, look, we are a big polluter because we are producing goods which are uh, coming with a lot of uh, CO2 emission. And we're producing those goods which were produced by advanced countries before. And we're producing those goods which are consumed by advanced countries' consumers. So who is responsible for the, uh, the pollution? Is it the final consumption or is it uh, uh, the producers in uh, several uh, emerging countries. And you see that this has a direct impact on, uh, on inequality because uh, China is still much uh, uh, less rich than uh, the United States or than uh, Europe. So uh, because of that, I believe that uh, this issue of inequality and uh, uh, pollution is, uh, is, is a difficult, and I'm not sure this is the right question to, 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 to be asked. It is something else. The, the right question might be to say, if we want to reduce pollution, if we want to reduce CO2 emission, will this have an impact on inequality within the country? Will it be the case that some people will be more affected by this kind of uh, ecological policies than other people? And uh, uh, this there, we might uh, possibly say something about this, but I don't think that there is any uh, general rule about uh, about, this. about the definition of consumption. Uh, it depends very much on uh, what uh, uh, people want to consume. 
but we are still living in a world where there is a huge uh, uh, proportion of the population which needs material consumption. Uh, if you look at the whole world, uh, you have uh, what eighty uh, percent of uh, the uh, whole population, which in terms of uh, the standard of living of advanced countries are poor. Mm. We will not say to those people, look, you have to dematerialize, and instead of uh, having more food or more uh, uh, manufactured goods or more uh, bicycles or motorcycles uh, and cars, uh, then uh, uh, you have to consume some uh, dematerialized uh, services. <laughs> I don't think this is realistic for the moment. No. So I'm not sure that is really the, the the way to go forward. Yeah. So it's a first world perspective you're saying, and then, uh, but but of course it's a big discussion in uh, now uh, climate measurements, for instance, in the European Union, where they now talk about the just and fair transition, in which uh, you you do want to have policies which actually do not increase inequality, policies on the environmental policies that increase inequality. Yeah, but I think that uh, I'm not sure that inequality is really the main issue in uh, this uh, policy. Mm. For the moment, the real issue is how do you make the transition toward uh, a carbon-free uh, economy without hurting the whole population? Yeah. And in particular, the poor people. Exactly. So maybe inequality is somewhere. I would say that is more an issue of let's make sure that we are not hurting the uh, poorest people in yeah. uh, uh, those countries. Yeah. And uh, th there is nothing uh, uh, obvious in doing that. We have to understand, and this is really the big problem uh, for uh, uh, those uh, environmental policies. We have to understand if you want to transition toward a carbon-free economy, there will be a cost to be paid, and this cost will have to be paid by more or less everybody in our society. And this is what is making this transition is so difficult to decide politically because who is the government who will decide to get into this kind of policy that will hurt uh, uh, most people in, uh, in, in, in the society? Clear. Professor Anderson, last question for you, and then I'm going to go uh, uh, to Jim Suri to reflect on what he heard today. And it's a question from uh, Mandy Astola. We talked a lot about inequality as a societal uh, uh, phenomenon, right? And the responses to that. But of course, your latest book is about inequality between the power relations in the firm. Uh, and uh, Mandy Astola wants to ask you, do you think that the Democrat, Democrat uh, uh, Um, democratic trends in the management, sociocracy, she calls it co-creation, co-design, these trends, can they solve the problem of unfair workplaces or do we need more? Well, <laughs> in the United States, I don't see much of a trend. I see high, more and more concentration of power at, at the top of the corporate ladder. This is connected to uh, the, the increasing prevalence of precarity at work. The fact that ordinary workers are less and less confident even of having a steady hours and a stable income over time. With increasing precarity, you have to buckle down and subject yourself even more to whatever arbitrary and domination you're subjected to by whoever's cutting your paycheck uh, uh, that, you know, that week. Mm. So I do think that we need some a lot of experimentation in the American context in democratizing the workplace. I can't say exactly how that would work. Uh, there are differences between the organization of work in, in the United States and, and in Europe that we can't just immediately import policies attacked that, no. that have worked in Europe. Uh, so that's why I think we're, we have to enter an exper uh, uh, many experiments to find out What, works. what could actually be affected. Clear. I see that Professor Bourguignon also wants to respond uh, very shortly because the time is almost uh, uh, up. Uh, but uh, please. No, very shortly. I wanted to say simply that uh, technological change, in particular the digitization of uh, our uh, uh, economies, also producing uh, a uh, change in the power of uh, workers with respect to employers. Mm. And it likely that the uh, uh, relationship between salaried worker 
and uh, employers will change very much in the coming uh, uh, years uh, because of uh, this uh, uh, flexibility that is uh, being introduced by the technology. Clear. It is something that we should be really very yeah. careful about. Thank you so much for adding. Thank you so much for now. I'm going to ask uh, Jim Suri now to join us and to ask him, oh, well, you kick-started this conversation. What is your reflection on what we talked about today? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I heard a lot of good uh, things. So thanks again to the to our guests of today. Um, there, there was a great start by, by Anderson, and she said uh, that we have to set the rules of the game. And I think both guests have made clear that they... Uh, don't think that the current game is the optimal game. And then we have to ask the question, which game do we want to play now? And again, I think we have to play a game where we centralize the well-being of everyone and not every uh, human being, but the entire planet as a whole. Uh, of course, we need more equality in order to do that. Uh, it was a difficult question for Bugit Jung as well and for me as well to to, to define the optimal level of this inequality. But I think equality goes hand in hand with freedom. And if you find an optimal way, we have to use uh, innovation and technology in order to strive for uh, more well being. And um, we also have to make sure that in this path, uh, we are limited by our planetary boundaries. So there was. A lot of a lot of being has been said about GDP, uh, economic growth, but of course most of the urgent problems today is that the rise of our um, global economic welfare is at the cost of uh, our natural world. So um, if we talk about equality and freedom. It's not about how humans perceive it, but for mm. the entire planet. Mm. A broader perspective. Uh, and um, did you hear something? Because you were, of course, advocate. I already asked. I also asked them. Uh, uh, you were advocating an, a notion of consumption focus, and the speakers were, especially Professor Bourguignon, said, "Well, um, for many, pers it, we, well, I, in my words, a first world perspective, because 70, sixty to eighty percent of the world population is still need uh, uh, consumption. What's your I idea about that?" Yeah, well, I agree what uh, Bourguignon said because it's very uh, almost arrogant to say, okay, people in Africa, they, they have to focus on dematerialization of yeah. our economy when their basic needs are not fulfilled. But on the other hand, uh, in developed countries where we have a lot of materialized um, economic welfare, we do have the ability to shift towards the dematerialization of, uh, of our welfare. Yeah. One of the trends that both um, Professor Bourguignon and Professor Anderson mentioned was the rise of the precar precarious work, in, uh, especially, in, for example, in Europe or in America, so the Western world. Do you worry about that as well? Mm, what exactly do you mean with it? The rise of precarious jobs and precarious work. So no, no fixed contracts, uh, fixed hours, uh, no, no, no gig economy. Labor, work, labor relationship, which is a bit secure. Ah, yeah. Well, yeah... I I also think that's a big, uh, big problem as well. And I think that's an effect of um, the rise of inequality um, defined by power. Mm. So uh, I also said in the, in the introduction statement that freedom of the one uh, does not have to lead to less freedom of the other. And I think this is an effect of mm. that point. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would like to also thank uh, uh, Professor Bourguignon and Professor Anderson for joining uh, this conversation in rethinking, reimagining uh, capitalism. Of course, uh, I have a list of questions, uh, which is uh, five pages long. And uh, of course, um, all sentences you, s you spoke were actually creating all these new questions which we cannot uh, discuss in this short uh, 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 period of time. But thank you so much for joining us. We will continue this conversation, especially on, of course, 
uh, precarious situations in developing countries and the, and the responsibility for richer countries next week because we have Mohammed Yunus and Jeffrey Sachs uh, uh, with us. Uh, but it's very important for you if you because we we're going to pre-record that session because of the time difference with Bangladesh. If you want to join us, you should uh, write an email to Julia at theswijger.nl because then we're going to invite you especially to ask questions to Mr. Sachs or Mr. Yunus. Julia at theswijger.nl if you want to live join the conversation. Otherwise, it's pre-recorded and you'll just see the result at the same time we normally uh, show this um, uh, live cast. So uh, I hope you will join us next week. We will focus on aligning economies to end poverty, uh, a next topic in our our research for today. I thank you for watching and asking all these brilliant questions. And Eveline Verhagen, I'm so honored you're, you visited us for all events. Thank you for doing that. And uh, hope uh, I see all of you next week. Thank you.